setting the motion to compel. I'd like to have a reminder to check with opposing counsel's calendar. Sometimes paralegals will forget that and then we're going to end up having to reschedule it. Of course, again, the clients do not like this courtesy. They view it as a courtesy. Why are you being nice to them? We're not being nice to them. The rules provide, ethical guidelines provide that we take these steps. And just as a practical matter, if they can't be there, they can't be there. So we're going to have to reschedule it anyway. So we need to take the step of checking with both our client's calendar, reminder to do that, and with opposing counsel's calendar so that everybody who needs to attend the hearing can attend the hearing. Now we're going to prepare for our hearing. The most important preparation is our order. We're going to bring a proposed order for the judge to sign. We're asking for attorney's fees, right? We've put that in our motion. That's why we took all these wonderful steps or one of the reasons. So we want to include a blank for the attorney's fees to be filled in and a blank for a specific date for them to produce the records that we're asking them to produce. We will leave a blank and let the judge fill those in. We need to have an attorney's fee summary. So if we're asking for attorney's fees, we have to be able to prove them up. So we have to tell the court it took us this much time to do the motion, this much time to appear here, this much time to prepare our order, and that's how we prove up our attorney's fees. And a little note, you'll see whenever this I is here, there's more information, you can just cursor over it. It says attorney's fee summary only associated with this topic. It's not the whole case, right? You're only going to be awarded attorney's fees for the time it took you to make them give you these documents through the court or to ask the judge to make you <laughs> make them give you these documents. It's not attorney's fees for the whole case. That's a different pleading. So when you do your attorney's fee summary, be sure if someone's preparing that for you that they understand that differentiation. It's not all the attorney's fees in the case up to date. And we do two things. One, we do um, billing statements. So you see the next one, have copies of your billing statements. And then our little extra information is redact any attorney-client privilege in the attorney's billing statement and highlight what you've included. So this is important for the lawyer so they know what they're testifying to. Examples of attorney-client privilege that could be in your bill is I spoke with Mary Sue about what a jerk Joe Bob is being and that Joe Bob keeps saying blah, 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 and that she keeps doing blah, blah, blah. You know, the contents, that information would be attorney-client privilege. So the portion that says telephone conference with Suzy Q, that's not attorney-client privilege. It's just what, what it was regarding. So you don't have to black out everything. You can just black out the portions that truly are attorney-client privilege. And then I like to have a clean version of the bills in case I'm crossed because, of course, the other lawyer can cross me on my fees. In case I'm crossed, I know what's under there. And then we highlight what we've included. So because the bill is on everything in the case and we're only talking about the billing associated with the motion to compel, we highlight that portion and show the court how that ended up being our total. And then we have a summary on the front. So our summary page would have every person who worked on the motion to compel and then their time and our estimated time for the hearing because you don't know that obviously ahead of time. Especially, you know how it is, you might be there an hour just waiting for the court. Okay, then I like to have three copies of the discovery requests I'm complaining have not been complied with, and then three copies of the letter requesting the information that I'm complaining that I did not receive, and three copies of their responses that I'm saying are inadequate because everybody's going to have to read along with all of this, right? Okay when you're up there you're going to be saying here judge is the what the request was here was their response here's their objection and then the order is almost going to look like a workbook because you're going to have number one we asked for all the bank records from 2009 and we're going to have the objection listed objection sustained or overruled and we're going to have a blank under sustained and a blank under overruled and the judge can check one off and then we're going to have lines, just blank lines like on a piece of paper underneath that for the judge to write any notes because sometimes they'll sustain as to part 
Like in that example, they may say, you know, 2009 is too far back, but you have a right to get 11, 12, and 13. So they'll say sustained as to 9 and 10, but overruled as to 11, 12, and 13. So we have lines so the judge can write whatever their ruling might be. So it does kind of look like a workbook, but it's very helpful to the court if you do it that way. And you'll get a very clear ruling, which will be helpful. We have an example of that type of order in the documents section of Smart Legal Practice.